drugs, show you which, uh, which drugs affect the TEDs, and um, uh, then we'll go through some case studies, okay? Give you guys some examples. Uh, how many are here for pharmacy? These three? Nursing? Those five, okay. <laughs> the lab is these three, and physicians? One, two, three. Okay, great. All right, let's get started. My name, uh, do we want to cut one of the lights to get a better, yeah. we'll give maybe it a try. cut the front lights here? Yeah, who knows how they've got them set up here. This, can you see it better? Is this okay? My name is Tim Bogwatt. They know me as Tim the Tech Man. And I've been doing this for 10, 11 years. So this is what I do. This is what I have to do. The TEG is a uh, laboratory-based coagulation analyzer. That's first and foremost. It will differentiate surgical bleeding from pathological bleeding. All right? And, it, and more importantly, what we've been able to find out in using it at this hospital and other facilities, it gives you tremendous information on your prothrombotic patients. So for the very first time, you have a device in the laboratory on a blood test I can show you which patients are prothrombotic, okay, and are at risk for thrombosis. The TEG is specific to factor deficiency. We look at functional fibrinogen, not uh, fibrinogen count. We look at true platelet function, not platelet count, okay. Uh, we do see the hypercoagulable patient. Uh, we'll get into a value um, later on in this class talking about the strength of the clot to withstand shearing forces circulating blood flow. Very important value right here. And also the tech can see lysis. Very nicely. The TED will provide analysis for a specific transfusion. It will, it will give you an amount of FFP to give, an amount of cryo to give, same with platelets. It will detect, like we said, fibrinolysis, but it will show you if the lysis is primary or secondary. Secondary, you know, is stage 1 DIC. And again, it will provide you the analysis of the prothrombotic patient under the influence of coagulation inhibitors. Why is blood conservation important? I don't know if you know this. This is about what it costs the hospital to buy blood component. Okay? The College of American Pathologists uh, did a study January of 2010 uh, where they added in all the hidden costs of blood and it came out to about $2,000 per unit, which it costs the hospital to, to get blood from. So by giving 10 units of cryo, that's $20,000. Okay? Very expensive. Here are possible transfusion indicators. The ones we're going to concentrate on that are mostly abused are these two right here. We'll get into this in a minute. For an open heart surgery, we do four sample types. You only see three listed here, but we do do four. But we do one prior to surgery, and we recommend any patient going to surgery should have a TEG or a platelet, what we call a platelet mapping baseline done on them. We'll get into the platelet mapping assay a little bit later. But we want to find out if there's a coagulopathy present prior to surgery, should it be treated now or should we wait till the end of the case? And then if they are on platelet inhibitors, aka aspirin, Plavix, all drugs of that nature there, yes. are they even working? Okay, because I know in any surgical procedure, if a patient's on Plavix, the package insert for Plavix is take the patient off the drug for five days, then take them to surgery. Okay? Well, we want to find out, is the Plavix even working? It does not work in all patients. We do a second sample during the procedure when they begin to rewarm on bypass, and we, we have an assay with the tag that, that we utilize a um, enzyme called heparinase. So even though the patient's fully heparinized, with, by utilizing heparinase in the blood sample, we can eliminate all the heparin on board in that sample. We can see where their coagulation profile is without the effects of heparin, which is really a cool thing to be able to do. The third sample that is not listed here is what we call a post-protamine sample. So once they give the protamine to reverse the heparin, run what we call a plain cup and a heparinase cup, 
and we want to see if the patient is bleeding, is it due to excess heparin, or is there a coagulopathy, or is it surgical? Okay? Today's heart, actually, the techs were normal, post protamine, took the patient up to the unit, the patient started dumping. Okay? We ran another tech post surgical in the ICU, this is this one here, and uh, we ran a plane in a heparinase. And we found out that the, there was no coagulopathy, there was no excess heparin, so the reason they did it was surgical, they took the patient back. So the whole idea is just because they're bleeding, okay, doesn't necessarily mean we've got to give them blood component. All right? What we're trying to do is apply science to what's going on with the patient. Now, if they're not bleeding through their chest tubes, this bothers me a little bit because they could be prothrombotic. And this is dangerous because they could, in effect, clot off their grafts. All right? And if they are prothrombotic, we want to know, are they enzymatically hyper? In other words, thrombin-based. Are they platelet function hyper, platelet-based, or are they both? And we'll get into this in a bit. These are the objectives of incorporating TED. One, we want to reduce the amount of FFP cryoplatelets given to the patient. And two, we want to improve analysis for your prothrombotic patient. In hemostasis management, we look at two sides. We look at the hemorrhagic side and we look at the prothrombotic side. On the hemorrhagic side, if they're bleeding, is it drug induced, surgically induced, pathologically induced, or is there fibrinolysis occurring? Okay. If they're prothrombotic, as I stated earlier, is it enzymatically related, platelet function related, are they restenosing, or is there a non-drug response, i.e. patient given Plavix or aspirin, and they're not responding to the drug. Okay. The whole idea is to reduce your brain backs and to identify your fibrinolytic patient. Simple definition for hemostasis, it's a delicate balance between the proteins, the platelets, and the lytic system to promote its end product to clot. Okay. I have a question for you. The clot's made up of two components. Do you know what they are? Two components make up a clot. One is fibrin is one, the other is platelets. Fibrin and platelets make up the clot. Okay? So, if we're treating a patient with platelets, we're going to affect the lytic system or we're going to affect the coag protein. So if we treat the lytic system, we're going to affect these two sides. And if we treat the coag proteins with FFP, we're going to affect the lytic and the platelet side. The whole concept with this slide is <coughs> hemostasis like life. Nothing is static. Everything interacts with everything else. Okay, so if you treat one part, you do have an effect on the other parts. My most favorite slide of all, this is right in the middle here, is a clot. It takes all of this in balance to form a clot. Okay? The beauty about this is when you look at an INR, okay? INR strictly looks at this protein right here. All it sees, one protein. But clinical decisions are made on one protein. Your PTT looks at one, two, three, four. Those four <coughs> proteins, that's all it sees. What the TED sees is all of this in global net work. Looks at the plasma proteins. It looks at the vascular wall. It looks at the epithelial cells and it looks at the platelets. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, I was admitted to a hospital recently, a couple weeks ago, for a couple of days, and they were running PTPTs on me. <laughs> and I was saying, "Well, Tim, your PTT is a little long. Your INR is this." I said, "That's okay. My tags are normal. Do not treat the PT or the INR." And they wouldn't. So the purpose of the clot is to prevent hemorrhage while at the same time impede thrombosis. It achieves this through an enzymatic and a platelet function balance. If we are in balance one way, we hemorrhage. If we're in balance the other way, we have thrombosis. And as we stated, the clot's about 20% fibrin and 80% platelet. Okay? 
So keep this in mind when you're doing PTs, PTTs, INRs, ACT, fibrin split product, fibrin degradation product, the dimer, what you are looking at is 20% of the picture. All you see. Because all those tests are plasma assays, they spin out the platelets. Okay? You say, well, geez, Stan, we do do a platelet count. It's okay, what does platelet count tell you? Just the number of platelets there are, right? It was very interesting when, I've, interesting when I first came to this hospital to do a trial for the heart team. Dr. Mayer had the first case up, and he was at the scrub sink, and I like talking to the surgeon at the scrub sink before the case, and uh, just to see what kind of case it is, da 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 da. And so Dr. Mayer said, yeah, it's going to be a tough case. And I said, well, how's the coax look? He said, uh, uh, platelets are normal, PTs are normal. I said, well, how do you know the platelets are functioning? I would rather walk around with 20,000 functioning platelets than any of the 200,000 non-functioning platelets. Okay? Functionality is the key, not count. This is the way the TEG works. I won't spend too much time on it. What we use is a little plastic cup. And inside the cup, we put a third of a cc of whole blood. And we activate that whole blood with kale. Okay? Suspended above the cup is a metal pin that's tied into a torsion wire that runs through a transducer. The cup rotates back and forth, 4 degrees, 45 seconds, minutes. And while the cup is rotating back and forth, when the pin is submerged in the cup, when, when the blood is liquid, all we're going to see is a straight line. So if this was heparinized whole blood, all we would see is a straight line all the way across. When the pin senses the first fiber and fiber attached to it, it creates a torque on this torsion wire which causes the signature curve to split open. As the cup rotates one way, it plots the curve up. When it rotates the other way, it plots the curve down. So if we bisected this curve, the top will mirror the bottom. Okay? And then eventually, the, the clot will unify the pin and the cup as one. So now the pin will start traveling at the same speed and distance that the cup travels, thus giving us what we call a functional amplitude. Okay? And then eventually, the pin will break free from the movement of the cup because the clot starts to lice or break down, and that's where you see this breakdown occurring right here. Right? We put this curve on an x and y axis. Your vertical axis is amplitude or clot strength. So a way to remember this, the wider the curve, the stronger the clot. The narrower the curve, the weaker the clot. Okay? Then our horizontal axis is time. What we're looking at is the strength of the clot over time. That's the technology. It's actually very simple. We'll go through the tech parameters. They seem like a lot, but you're only going to need to know three parameters. First one is SP, stands for split point, and it takes its measurement from the very start of the assay to when the curve first splits or opens up. It wants to see how much time does that take, okay? Uh, it is in minutes, and what it's representing is the production of prothrombin, factor two, okay? The next value is R time stands for reaction time, and where we see it on the curve is from the very start of the assay to when it splits and reaches a two millimeter of amplitude. Then we got significant fiber formation on the pin. Clinically, it represents the production of thrombin. Okay? Without thrombin, you cannot form a clot. The normal ranges are five to ten minutes. The beauty about R is that if the R time is less than five minutes, that means the patient is enzymatically hypercoagulable. They are at risk for throwing red clot, okay, thrombin-based clot. The way to lengthen the R time or slow down the production of thrombin is to give an anticoagulant, okay? If your R time is between 10 and 14 minutes, that means we're factor deficient, thrombin's coming too slow. The TEG is not sensitive enough to tell you which factor they're deficient in, so our recommended treatment protocol is FFP. It's got all the factors. We know by giving one unit of FFP, that will lower your R time two and a half minutes. Okay, so two FFP, which is normally the order, will lower your R five minutes. R time greater than 14 minutes, four FFP and no more. 
The next value, you do not see a signature curve here because delta is a calculation. Calculation for delta is R minus SP. So if your R time is 10 minutes and your SP is 9.5 minutes, you have a delta of 0.5. And what it's expressing is the initiation and the burst and the duration of that burst of thrombin. So this is actually what we're looking at with SP is prothrombin, delta is mesothrombin, and R is thrombin. So prothrombin to mesothrombin to thrombin. That's what's occurring with these values here. And the normals are 0.7 to 1.1. They're got their thrombin formation is normal. Anything less than 0.7, they're enzymatically hyper. So here you would treat with the anticoagulant. And anything greater than 1.1, they are enzymatically hypocoagulable. You would treat with FFP. Next value is known as uh, delta F or fibrinogen, also K time. And what it's looking at or where it's measuring is how long does it take the clot to go from 2 millimeters of amplitude to 20 millimeters of amplitude. And what it's looking at is how fast is that fibrin and platelet bonding occurring. Okay, is it coming slow? Is it coming fast? There are no treatment algorithms associated with K-time. Next value is angle. Angle is true representation of uh, functional fibrinogen. And it is a measurement in degrees. And where it takes its, uh, its calculation from is right at the, it draws a tangent from the 20 millimeter mark where K ends to the split point. If we bisect this curve, it's measuring the, uh, this interior angle right here. The treatment for angle is cryo. Anybody know why we give cryo for poor angles? What's the problem? Cryo is very rich in fibrinogen factor eight. Okay. So the dosing for cryo should be by body weight, 0.06 units per kilo. I know it always gets ordered in 10 packs. Give me 10 of cryo, give me 20 of cryo. Okay, but you know, a 100 kilo patient would only get six units of cryo. Okay. Now, cryo is one of the last products I will recommend for transfusion. And the reason being it's high transfusion risk. Why? Because it's multi-donor product. Okay? So if we have a shallow angle, let's say this angle slopes this way instead of like this. So we have a shallow slope. Uh, and I don't have anything to draw with here. But what we would probably see is we'd see a long R time, shallow slope, and a narrow MA. Uh, one way to, to increase this slope instead of giving cryo is to give FFP. <coughs> okay. FFP pre, uh, uh, contains fibrinogen in it. So if we shorten up the R time, improve the thrombin production, now we have the thrombin to cleave fibrinogen to fiber. That will increase your angle. Okay. Another way to increase the angle without giving cryo is to give platelets. Why? Because when platelets degranulate, they throw off fibrinogen from their phospholipid surface. And platelets contain fibrinogen in them. Okay? A couple of ways to increase your angle without giving cryo. So your SPR, delta K, and angle represent the coag protein part of the hemostasis equation. The value to know is delta. MA, excuse me for this drawing, it is incorrect. The MA is measured from the top of the curve to the bottom of the curve. Um, it does, uh, stands for maximum amplitude and it represents platelet function, not count. Okay? Normal ranges are 50 to 70 millimeters. We know, and this is the importance with MA, we know if MA is greater than 70 millimeters, that patient has a 70% uh, predictability to have an ischemic event. DBT, stroke, MI, PE. Okay? And that's documented in the literature. So the way to lower your MA is to give platelet inhibition. So what's beautiful about this, if you see, it, and I've looked at the data from your hospital with over about 15 months now that you've been using it, about 65% <coughs> of your hearts are going into the case prothrombotic to start with. They've had their event. 
And the, and the interesting part about this is once they get to the ICU, they're going to go back to their prothrombotic state. That's where they live at. So what we can do is if we can identify these people prior to the case, at the end of the case when the vasculature heals, give them that platelet in addition to protect them. <coughs> If your MAs are low, then the way to increase your MAs is by giving platelets. And if it's borderline, we recommend the drug DDAVP for adhesion. Let me give you a clinical example here. Let's say we have a patient in the ICU, they got an MA of 45. So they're right in here, right? So we order a platelet for each for them. Okay? One platelet for each should increase your MA 9 millimeters. That's also documented. So let me give you a clinical scenario. We have a patient in the ICU, they have an MA of 45, we, and they're bleeding. We give them a platelet for each. Uh, they continue to bleed post-transfusion. We order another tag, and the MA comes back at 45. Why did it not go to 54? And this happens, by the way. You get your money back on the platelets. Yeah. The platelets that were transfused were non-functional platelets. How does the blood bank know that the platelets they're sending up are functional? <laughs> they don't. They don't? They don't know. I am a tremendous example of this. Uh, I am 35% naturally, pathologically inhibited on my ADP receptors. It's genetic. As I test with my sister, she's the same. I'm a poor platelet donor. And good news for me, I'm at low risk for uh, a thrombotic event. The bad news is if I went to surgery, I would probably be part of the platelet transfusion. Okay? Here's another thing that affects the platelets. What I term nutraceuticals, your ginkgo biloba's, your green teas your omega-3s, your fish oils, high fish in your diets, your glucosamine chondroitins, all these inhibit your platelets. So how many of us are on these things? A lot of people. A lot of people. Someday, donor centers will test people with like this before they can donate platelets. With stick, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Someday. Yeah. So, so it means, so, you know, they give back negative, they don't take them. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the whole idea is just because you're giving platelets does not mean you're giving the count, but you may not be giving functional platelets. Okay, so just something to think about. This is another reason why we suggest patients go into surgery, get a tech done on them to see if their platelets are functioning, even though they have count. So now we recommend to do tech before and after? Yes, absolutely. And, and the whole idea is to just give you another tool to help you see what's going on with the patient's hemostasis. You know what I mean if the patient bleeding from platelets and I give him the units and he doesn't bleed, I still I have to do tag or just... No, no, no. If they stop bleeding... So I don't order right. automatic tag except if he stop bleeding, if he's still bleeding. Correct. Oh, yeah. okay. Absolutely. That makes need sense. To be clear, yeah, yeah you, you want to look at the field too. Uh, yeah, You're clinical. Right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> and, and I got to tell you, the TEMS a wonderful <coughs> device. It's not a 100% device. Nothing is. But it's the best thing out there over what you're currently used to using. The tag has got a 95% predictability in it, very high sensitivity, versus a PT INR, which is in the 40 percentile range. Next value, if you walk out of here and you forget everything, please remember G. G is the most important value of the whole instrument. And we talked about it earlier. G actually measures the plot strength's ability to withstand shearing forces of circulating blood flow. This is important. You have a weak clot. Uh, let, let me back up a little bit. G is a calculation. 90% of your G value stems from your platelet function. 10% of your G value comes from your protein coax. Okay? And the normal ranges are 4,500 to 11,000 dynes per square centimeter. Okay? And we know that if G is less than 4.5, that's an 87% predictor the patient will bleed. 
Reason being is the clot's too soft to withstand the shearing force of the circulating blood flow. The way to increase G would be a little platelet. One platelet per reads will increase this G 1.0. Okay. G is greater than 11. That is a 70% predictor the patient will have an ischemic event. <coughs> the way to lower your G value, give platelet inhibition. <coughs> Very interesting, uh, Dr. Pantera has been using this on his patients. And he's now starting to titrate his meds based on the values this is giving to help his patients. And he is having tremendous success. May I give one of the anecdotes? Sure. It's really Please. striking. Some of you may have heard it. Uh, some months ago, uh, he, as Tim said, started using this uh, for his uh, patients at risk for stroke. <clears throat> and he has a uh, uh, set of identical twins, men about 40, 45 years old, uh, whose father died of a stroke at about 45. And um, he called them in and said, look, guys, you've got to come in now and get this test. One of them did right away, one said, I'll be there next week. That second one had a stroke and died before he could come in for the test. The other one came in terribly hypercoagulable and now being treated properly. So that's an anecdote. And the plural of anecdotes is not data. But this stuff works. This is amazing. I'm very sad about that. Another anecdote, and actually this is in an IRB study at Kaiser and Vallejo, which is their Northern California Stroke Center, okay? And they've done over 700 patients, and what they found out is these are post-stroke uh, techs they're doing on these patients in the first part of the IRB. They found that every one of their patients that had uh, stroke had genes greater than 11. 100% of them. That's scary. So recommendation, every stroke young people, we should overtake. It, it's the only test that's going to show you if the stroke was caused due to hypercoagulability. Okay, you have nothing to show you a prothrombotic patient. There's no symptoms until after the event. So we are, we are promoting this for screening. People that have family history of that. It doesn't hurt to get screened. It's a simple blood test to see if they're at risk. And if they are, is the risk caused by thrombin? Because if it is, then you put them on anticoagulant, icumidin. If it's platelet function related, put them on platelet inhibitors. But to just put them on an anticoagulant, where we'll see later on in some case studies, my question has always been to physicians, and you guys can help me with this. Why do people with therapeutic INRs have ischemic events? Does it work? Platelets, yeah. Platelets. It's the platelets. Okay, now you have a tool to see the whole picture and to make clinical decisions. So, let me yes, sir. so it means if the patient, for example, incumbent for AFib, okay? okay? And the tic tag and the platelets doesn't work, so you recommend to give incumbent and blabex? Sure. So, and, and, this is and, 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 and really you need to. to do that. I don't want that, right? Well, you really want this too. Uh, yeah, exactly, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, right, so, I mean, okay, here's a good Because example. I don't protect him from AFib. You can protect him from a fib with but, still, still but if his platelets are super hyper, the coumadin is not going to touch that. And not going to touch it. Yeah. Okay. So, Here's a good example. Why do patients on mechanical valves? Why must they be put on coumadin? Why? So they don't have the problems on the valve. Ah. Okay. What on the valve? Let's see is going to cause thrombin to be activated. Once the vasculature is healed, what's going to activate the thrombin? I, I always thought it was just a mechanical Nothing. What's going to activate the valve is going to activate surface activation of the platelets. So we've just concluded a study in Puerto Rico. We couldn't do this in the United States. We did it in Puerto Rico. In, uh, there was like 240 some odd patients, all mitral valves. 
None of them got put on cumin. They all got put on aspirin, Plavix. None of them had a post-event. None. So with this tag study, can you get a greater uh, understanding of why traditionally, historically, cumin is, is very erratic in terms of being able to titrate to the therapeutic ion? Does this give you any better understanding in terms yes. of why somebody, some people do and some people don't? Uh, yes, absolutely, <clears throat> because some people have more active platelets, and it just depends on how the person metabolizes the cumulative, too. I mean, we're all different. Yeah, but by your study in Puerto Rico, yeah. the platelets would be normal. We still, you are going to say that these people has to take platelets, even if they are incompetent. Yes. The mechanical valve. Yes, because, so, it, and we'll get to this in a second later yeah. on in the course, oh, okay? It's okay? a great question. Yeah. Hold on to that. I will, I, will it work with also, I will address that. Yes. yes. Okay. Because of its, its effects on uh, thrombin, wouldn't that also decrease the likelihood of a, of a particular Not necessarily, only due to, uh, your, your logic is there, Joe, but if you have surface activation of the platelets, your ADP receptor, uh, the cumulative is not going to touch that. The platelet can be activated by surface activation, and the most prominent activation of the platelet is from rantel. But there's other receptors on the platelets that activate. You have collagen receptors, you got uh, surface activation receptors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Yes, you mentioned the DKDP uh, as a potential, but that wouldn't really help it with G less than four point five. No. no, 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 no. We're looking at DDADP to stop bleeding. Right. Yeah. So we'd be looking at DDADP uh, uh, if, in fact, we're kind of like borderline here and we don't need the transfusion. But we'll get into the DDADP in more detail a little bit later. Okay. So your MA and G values represent the platelet part of the equation. The value to know is G, hot strength. Last values are EPL and LY30. EPL stands for estimated percent of lysis, and then LY30 is lysis 30 minutes after MA. EPL is estimating where LY30 is going to finish. Okay, that's all it is. And it is an expression of primary or secondary fibrinolysis. And you only need to be concerned when your LY30 is greater than 80%. So if we drew a box around the maximum amplitude of this curve, what we're measuring is this percentage of breakdown compared to the whole. And okay, that's what we're looking at. Now, how is it primary and how is it secondary? The definitions are as follows. If your LY30 is greater than 8%, then we have a normal R time and a normal G value, then you have primary fibrinolysis. The treatment is antifibrolytic of choice, amicar or tranexamic acid. Okay? If your LY30 is greater than 8% and you have a hyper R time and or a hyper G, then you have what we call term secondary fibrolysis or stage 1 DIC and the treatment is anticoagulant, heparin or lobinox. Even though the patient's bleeding, this is the treatment. Because by giving component, you're just going to fuel the consumption and the breakdown. Okay? I, I had this in a trauma case in an ER once. A pregnant woman came in from a car accident. She was bleeding. We ran a test and found out she was in stage 1 DIC. Okay? So I looked at the, uh, the attending uh, trauma surgeon. And uh, he says, well, I need to give heparin. I said, well, I don't know if you want to give heparin to a pregnant woman. So what did we end up giving that person? Lobinox. Lobinox will not cross the placental barrier. And she stopped bleeding like that. Amazing. So your EPL and your LY30 represent the lytic part of the equation. So let me throw something out at you. Here's the story that Teg will tell you. The initiation of thrombin cleaving fibrinogen to fibrin 
interacting with the platelet function to produce a clot strength able to withstand the shearing force and circulate blood flow, and is there any fibrinolysis? It gives you a total panel with whole blood. So my question to you is, clinically, if all these values are normal and the patient's bleeding, what's the cause? Holes. Surgical. Yeah. Or, one other reason, adhesion. The TEG, because it's in vitro, cannot see if the clot is sticking to the vascular wall. Okay, it can't see that. So that's where we use the drug DDABP. It releases all the von Willenbrunn's factor, factor VIII from the endothelium. Von Willenbrunn's will go straight to the glycoprotein 1B receptor on the platelet, which is the adhesion receptor, and that should make the platelet stick to the vascular wall. If the patient continues to bleed, post DDADP, it is surgical. It's surgical bleed. Okay. So, quick review, your proteins, SPR, delta P, and angle, no delta. You have a low delta, you give anticoagulant. You have a high delta, FFP. Your platelets, no G. Uh, you have a low G, you give platelets. You got a high G, you give platelet inhibition. And your LY30 represents the lytic part, and it's either primary or secondary fibrinolysis. Primary, you give antifibrinolytic of choice. Uh, secondary, you give anticoagulant. Now, if the patient is in stage 2 DIC, which is full consumption, again, by throwing blood component at these patients, you're going to fuel the consumption. And Dr. Uh, uh, Hewitt actually showed me some trauma patients where the TEG actually showed the endothelium just shut down and died. And all we saw was straight line. There was no way of reviving that patient. Okay, so the way we attack stage 2 DIC is to give the drug Novo 7. Okay, Novo 7 is good because it stimulates thrombin, plus it has a stimulating effect on activating the platelets. Okay. We'll go through some examples of these later. Here's some typical curves. This is what a normal looks like. Here's a factor deficient patient, see the long R time. Here's a platelet uh, dysfunctional patient, narrow MAs. This is what primary fibrinolysis looks like. Normal uh, or hypo R times, angles, and MAs, and tremendous breakdown. Here's what a hypercoagulable patient looks like, very short R times, steep ang angles, wide MAs. Okay, here's DIC stage one, again, Secondary fibrolysis, secondary to primary hypercoagulability. So by giving an anticoagulant here, we're going to slow down the production of thrombin, lengthen the R time, the rest of this will return to normal. This is what we call stage 2 DIC. This is where we recommend Novo 7. And what are all the components of Novo 7? Sorry, sir. What are the components of Novo 7? I don't know the chemical makeup, Joe. Do you Factor 7, factor seven. Is factor seven. Yeah. yeah. Is just for common factor, factor 7. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's also you think uh, might have to be something. <laughs> yeah, you think it would have to be something, because that's what they were given overseas in the... Uh, in, in the war zone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But well, they made your whole come over there. Yeah. yeah. There, there are some issues about their dosages over there. Right. That, that was the problem. What we recommend, you have to remember, if you give Novo 7, you got to remember it is a drug put on the market for hemophiliac use. To give Novo 7 to a heart patient as a last ditch effort, okay, and by throwing 90 bikes per kilo at them, which is the dosing for a hemophiliac, you just bombard a cardiac patient and you can clot off grass very easily. So what we re recommend for hearts is about 20 to 30 mics per kilo, a lot less. It works very good. And the traumas, I think, are less well defined. Yeah, traumas, uh, again, we don't have the answers to everything, but we're learning every day. You have to remember, hemostasis is a field like this, and we still only know about this much about it. So we're continuing to learn every day. 
This is what a typical signature curve looks like. You'll see the curve up here. Below you'll see the values we just discussed. And below that, the unit of measure, where the patient's sample value actually uh, came in, and below that are the normal ranges. That's what a normal curve looks like. That's what a hyper curve looks like. Again, short R times, steep angles, wide MAs. This is what secondary fibrinolysis looks like. Uh, short R times, steep angles, wide MAs, gradual breakdown, LY30 greater than 8. Um, next one is primary fibrinolysis. Uh, everything's normal here. We have tremendous breakdown, LY30 greater than 8. And this is just a treatment card. We have these throughout the hospital. Dr. Hewitt's got a bunch of these. That's, maybe he still does. I don't know. We've got Let's a few more. Give them all out. But here you have the tech values. Here's the clinical cause for those values. Now on this side, the suggested treatment protocols. 